We begin the new year with campaign 2016 and one of the people who continues to shake up the political world, Donald Trump. We caught up with him at his home in Palm Beach on New Year's Day and started our conversation with President Obama's expected plan for new executive actions on guns, including expanding background checks to purchases at gun shows. We asked Mr. Trump what he thought about the president's plan. Well, I don't like it. I don't like anything having to do with changing our Second Amendment. We have plenty of rules and regulations. There's plenty of things that they can do right now that are already there. They don't do them. We have a tremendous mental health problem. We're closing places all over the world, all over the country they're closing. So nobody's doing anything about that. All they want to do is blame the guns. And it's not the, the gun that pulls the trigger. So I don't like it. I don't like what he's doing. I think that He's looking to do executive orders to do something having to do with guns. Background checks, checks happen for normal gun purchases at a normal store. So his argument would be, you just do it here. It's this loophole. You want to make it the same everywhere. John, I'm going to have to take a look at it, but I don't like changing anything. Right now, they have plenty of rules and regulations, and they should be looking at mental health. I mean, we should build, like, institutions for people that are sickos. We have sickos all over the place. And that's the problem. So you'd spend some more money on look, that, maybe? Here's the problem. I would definitely spend more money on that. Here's the problem. The bad guys are always going to get the guns. You can have all the restrictions you want, but the bad guys are always going to have the guns. Let me ask you about executive orders in general. Like them, don't like them, that, that the president uses them to go around Congress? Well, I don't like them, and our country wasn't based on executive orders. Nobody really knew that we even had an executive order such a thing. It's supposed to be you get along with Congress and you conjole and you go back and forth and everybody gets in a room and we end up with deals. And there's compromise and lots of other things, but you end up with deals. Here's a guy just goes, he's given up on the process and he just goes and signs executive orders and everything. So if you were president, you seem like the kind of guy who if you were president, you might use an executive order or two though. Well, I will say this, there's a lot of precedent based on what he's doing. Now, some have been, you know, his executive order on the border. Amazingly, the courts actually took that back a step and did something that was very surprising, which is they did the right thing. So that may be that one. But I would I would be rescinding a lot of executive orders that he's done. I mean, he just, the one thing good about executive order, the new president, if he comes in, boom, first day, first hour, first minute, you can rescind that. Let me ask you about a video that's been put out by Al-Shabaab. This is an ISIS-affiliated terror group. And in the video, they use you, Donald Trump, a clip. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what is going on. And then the video goes on and says, the West will eventually turn against its Muslim citizens. They're saying to Muslims, either you join jihad or leave the United States because of what Mr. Trump is proposing. Look, there's a problem. I bring it up. Other people have called me and they say, well, you have guts to bring it up because, frankly, it's true, but nobody wants to get involved. Now people are getting involved. People that are on different persuasions than me right now, John, are saying, you know, maybe Trump isn't wrong. We want to examine it. There's a lot of bad stuff going on. I'm watching the news tonight, actually, CBS. And so many of the elements, you look at Germany, you look at Brussels, you look all over the world, they're shutting down cities that never had a problem before. They're shutting down countries that never had a problem before. You look at Paris, what happened. You look at California, what happened. John, maybe it's not politically correct. There's a big problem out there, but and it, we have to solve the problem. Does it concern you at all that you're being used in a, essentially a recruitment video by a terrorist they, organization? They use other people, too. I mean, what am I going to do? I have to say what I have to say. And you know what I have to say? There's a problem. We have to find out what is the problem? And we have to solve that problem. Do you think the problem is a, that the West is on a collision course with radical Islam, or is this just ISIS as a problem? I mean, is this well, a clash of civilizations? I think that radical Islam may be on a collision course with uh, us. I mean, you could change it around a little bit. But it is a very, very deep-seated hatred that's going on. I mean, you have a hatred like people, wouldn't, where they're willing to give their lives, they're willing to walk in. I have to tell you, it is so big. It is the biggest thing there is right now. When I watch President Obama say global warming is our biggest problem, it's just so sad to watch. And he doesn't want to use the words radical Islam. He doesn't want to use anything having to do with radical and Islam. So until he's willing to admit the problem, how can you not at least talk about the problem? And one of the things I've done is I brought the problem out. 
The world is talking about what I've said, and now big parts of the world are saying, Trump is really right, at least identifying what's going on. And we have to solve it. But you're not going to solve the problem unless you identify it. Let me ask you some questions about the presidency and a Trump presidency. Okay. Will you talk as much as a president as you do as a candidate? Will you be, will, will you be on TV all the time, uh, giving rallies, that kind of thing? Well, I think I would be giving rallies. I want to rally this country because our country has no spirit. I would certainly probably not talk as much. Look, right now I'm going, we originally we had 17 people. Now we're 14 people and 13 people. A lot of people are going to be dropping you out. You mean other candidates in the race? Other candidates. And so obviously I have to do a lot of talking. You know, I'm getting hit from 15 different sides. I like to defend myself, right? But no, I would be a much different person, I think, as president. But I would be very enthusiastic, like I am right now, toward the country. We need spirit. We need a cheerleader. President Obama is a bad cheerleader. I thought he'd be a good cheerleader. I thought he'd be a great cheerleader, actually. That's the one thing I thought, is that he was going to be a great cheerleader. He's really a big divider. We need cheerleading. We talked to some of your supporters, and a few of them said, when Donald Trump gets him to be president, he'll have people to coach him and kind of take off these rough edges of the things he says. Are they right? I don't think I have rough edges. I'll be honest with you. I went to an Ivy League school. I was a good student. I went to the Wharton School of Finance, the best business school in the world, probably, certainly, I mean, one of the great schools of the world. And I can be more politically correct than any coach that they can get me. I can be the most politically correct person with you. I could say something at the end of this interview. You would say, wow, was that boring. Give us a, give us a perfectly no, political just, look, correct thing. Here's the problem with political correctness. It takes too long. We don't have time. We don't have time. I talked about anchor babies at one news conference. And one of the reporters, actually from ABC, said, that's a derogatory term. I said, why? He said, well, it's derogatory. He didn't know why. And then I said, well, what would you call them? The babies of undocumented immigrants. So he gave me like a seven or eight word definition. I said, we don't have time for that. I'm sorry, we don't have time for that. Now look, I can be the most politically correct person that you've ever interviewed. It takes too much time. Isn't there a cost? People call, I think all the names they call you because of the things you say. Well, think of the fact that I'm leading in the poll by tremendous margins. And, you know, I think that's part of it, too. People don't want political correctness. They're tired of it today. And I think that's one of the things that has resonated with me. I don't go out of my way to be politically incorrect. When you think of the presidency, the day-to-day, -day, not the show part, not the outside, what's it going to be like? What do, you, do you think about that, the operation? I don't think president? about it because, look, here's the thing. What I think is the process. We have a lot of things to solve. We have a health care problem that's incredible. Obamacare is going up 25, 35, 45 percent. You see the deductible, what's happening, it's going up so high you're never going to be able to use it. Uh, you look at ISIS, you look at our militaries and shatters. I mean, you know, when you have General Ordiana saying it's not prepared, we're not prepared. As a military, we're not prepared. It's been one of the worst, you know, he said, I, and he actually said from the beginning, I watched him on an interview. He was talking about lack of preparedness from the beginning. You look at our vets, how badly they've been treated. You look at our borders, how people are just pouring across our borders. <laughs> There's plenty to do. They talk about the presidency and who has the finger on the button. The United States has not used nuclear weapons since 1945. When should it? Well, it, it is an absolute last stance. And, you know, I use the word unpredictable. You want to be unpredictable. And somebody recently said, I made a great business deal. And the person on the other side was interviewed by a newspaper. And how did Trump do this? And they said, he's so unpredictable. And I didn't know if he meant it positively or not. It turned out he meant it positively. We have to be a somewhat unpredictable in this whole thing. Nuclear, though, has to be an absolute last stance. Don't forget, I was against the war in Iraq. I'm not a fast trigger. You know, you have guys that you would think are, you know, very, very low-key. You know, they'd be faster than me. I would be a very slow trigger with nuclear. Nuclear is a major problem. And we have major problems because you have other people that would be very fast. And you look at North Korea, you look at some of these countries, I don't think they'd hesitate to use it if they really had it in a proper So manner. only if the United States is attacked. Maybe. It's really a last resort, as far as I'm concerned. President Obama signed an, uh, or, or said no more spying on our allies, but it, there's a report in the Wall Street Journal that there was spying on top Israeli officials. Would you say no spying on Israeli officials at all? I, I would certainly want, not want to do it, but I have to say this. Uh, we're being spied on by everybody. 
and it's terrible what's going on in that whole thing. I mean, we find out that we're being spied on by them, and they're being spied on. Everything's out. You know, the one bad thing about the computer generation, I have a son, he's nine years old, and he can virtually take apart any computer. These people are so brilliant with computers. You know, in the old days, when you're fighting a war, you give somebody an armed guard, and he has an envelope in his pocket, and he hands it to the general. Now it's going through so many channels, you don't know who's getting it. It's a real problem. So you don't. The problem with the computer age is I don't think you have secrecy anymore. So you'd leave open the possibility of spying on anybody, even allies? I would say that I would leave open possibilities of doing whatever it takes to make our country very, very strong and to make our country great again. Let's talk politics for a okay. minute. You said that Senator Cruz appeared to be kind of copying your immigration plan. Your plan, as I understand it, is deportations and then you'll let the good ones back in once they've left the country. His yeah, plan... Yeah, well, they have to go through a process. If they they go through a process. His plan is just deportations. Okay. So is he stricter on undocumented? No. Well, first of all, his plan just happened, okay? In fact, I was watching the other day and I was watching Ted talk and he said, we will build a wall. The first time I've ever heard him say it. And my wife, who was sitting next to me, said, oh, look, he's copying what you've been saying for a long period of time. No, no. I'm talking about deportation and people can come back into the country not just that group but other people can come back but everybody has to come into our country legally and I want a strong border and I'm the one that came up with it look when I announced that I was running I brought up illegal immigration it wasn't even a subject that would have been discussed in this debate and now it's one of the very big subjects. Ted Cruz is trying to step up his whole game on amnesty and on illegal immigration because it was actually quite weak. And you listen to him and Marco Rubio, they're trying to, you know, solve the problems that they've had in the past because they were both weak on it. And I have been very strong on it. So they're trying to get stronger on it. But look, nobody has that position like I have that position. I want the wall. I want strong borders. I want everybody out. Now people are coming to me. But nobody has that issue like me. And nobody's going to be able to do it like me. Nobody has an example on the wall. Nobody is getting Mexico to pay for the wall, the cost of the wall, but me. They don't even know about that. It's not even in their vocabulary. But nobody thinks you're going to get Mexico oh, to pay for the wall. You know why? They make a fortune with us. So much more money than what you're talking about. They're making a fortune. We have trade deficits. We have... If you look at the kind of numbers that Mexico makes with us, the wall is peanuts. Only a business person would say that. The politicians don't understand it. They're all talk and no action. Wouldn't, you said that the good ones would come back on an, on an expedited basis. Wouldn't Senator Cruz say, well, that's amnesty? I think that the good ones will be coming back, and I would say that we want to have them back, but we want to have a lot of other people. You know, we have one problem. We have millions of people waiting on a list that have gone through a legal process and they can't get into the country. We have to take care of them. I want people to come in. They just have to come back legally. When you say uh, uh, about Senator Cruz, not too many evangelicals come out of Cuba. What does that mean? Well, it just means that Cuba, generally speaking, is a Catholic country, and you don't equate uh, evangelicals with Cuba. I don't. I mean, I think of evangelicals, and I have a, I guess I am, you know, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Protestant, but I don't see it as coming out of Cuba. But you're not questioning whether, I mean, as far as you know, he could be more devout than you are. I, it's possible. Certainly it's possible. I'm not questioning. And I say it in a somewhat smiling manner, uh, but there's a little truth to it. <laughs> when we come back in one minute, Donald Trump talks about Hillary Clinton, women in the workplace, and about winning Iowa. We're back with more of our interview with Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton, what does it mean when you say she's playing the woman card? Oh, she's constantly playing the woman card. It's the only way she may get elected. I mean, frankly, I don't think anybody, I, personally, I'm not sure that anybody else other than me is going to beat her. And I think she's a flawed candidate. And you see what's happened recently, and it hasn't been a very pretty picture for her or for Bill, because I'm the only one that's willing to talk about his problems. I mean, what he did and what he has gone through, I think is frankly terrible, especially if she wants to play the woman card. What does it mean, though, to play the woman card, in your view? Well, she's playing it. She's just, you know, she is pandering. She is pandering to the public, and she's pandering to women. And when she did it with me, she talked about sexist, and I said, me, I have more respect for women, by far, than Hillary Clinton has. And I will do more for women than Hillary Clinton will. I'll do far more, including the protection of our country. She caused a lot of the problems that we have right now. You could say she caused the migration. 
Look at the problems in Syria. You mean Syria. as Secretary of State? As yeah. Secretary of State. I mean, the, the entire world has been upset. The entire world is, it's a different place. During Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's term, she's done a horrible job. She's caused so many of the problems. And let me tell you something. She's caused death. She's caused tremendous death with incompetent decisions. I was against the war in Iraq. I wasn't a politician, but I was against the war in Iraq. She voted for the war in Iraq. You said she caused death. How? Well, absolutely. Look at Libya. That was her baby. Look, I mean, I'm not even talking about the ambassador and the people with the ambassador, young, wonderful people, with messages coming in by the hundreds, and she's not even responding. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about all of the death that's been caused. And not only on our side, Their on the other side. Their pushback would be that there were people saved by going in and taking There's action. There's nothing saved. If we would have never done anything in the Middle East, we would have a much safer world right now. Getting rid of Saddam Hussein, I'm not saying he was a good person. He was a bad person. But what we have now is far worse, okay? And all of this has led to ISIS. All of this has led to the migration. All of this has led to tremendous death and destruction. And she, for the most part, was in charge of it, along with Obama. You say you'll do more for women than Hillary Clinton. How do you think a woman's experience in daily life is different than in the modern world than a man's? Well, I think they have a different life. I mean, it's a different life, but at the same time, I don't think women want to be pandered to. I think women don't like Hillary Clinton, to be honest with you, John. I think that women, and I see it all the time, and they tell me, you have to beat her, you have to win. She's a terrible person, she's a terrible person. Women are telling me that. I think, frankly, that women do not like Hillary Clinton. But are women, do they have uh, the same advantages of men in today's world? Do they? Well, I think they've come a long way, and I think I've certainly, within my company, done things that were very different, because 30 years ago, I had a woman in charge of building a massive building on Fifth Avenue, more than 30 years ago, and nobody would have done that in, ter in terms of construction. It was unheard of. I was way ahead, in, even to this day. I have so many women executives, and they're incredible, but I have been great to women in terms of the world of business, and I've been given great credit for that. You're going to spend $2 million on ads. What, what, what have no. people done? Oh, no. I'm going to spend $2 million on ads per week, at least. What do people not know about you that they need to see in Honestly, ad? I don't know. I think I'm probably wasting the money, but I'm $35 million under budget. Look, I was going to have 35 or $40 million spent by now. I haven't spent anything. I almost feel guilty. I think if you want to know the truth, I'm doing the ads. I'm leading by, as you will say, a lot. You can take the CBS poll. You can take any poll. And I'm winning by a lot. I don't think I need the ads. But I'm doing them. I almost feel guilty. And I'm 35 to $40 million under budget. I was going to have at least $35 million spent as of January 1st, which is now. I spent almost nothing. I feel guilty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a little money. I want to be certain. I want to be sure. And I think I'm going to do very well in Iowa. I think I'm going to do really well in New Hampshire. You know, New Hampshire, the polls are very, very powerful, very strong. And in Iowa, I'm leading. You know, nobody says it. In Iowa, the CNN poll, it's 33 to 20 that I'm leading. Ted Cruz is second. Nobody ever talks about that poll. That was a very major poll, probably the most expensive poll taken. But I'm at 33 to 20. I think I'm going to do very well in Iowa. And I'd love to win Iowa. And I could have said it differently. I could have said, well, I'd be OK. No, I want to win Iowa. I do great with the evangelicals. And I do great with the Tea Party. And I'm doing great. I have a real, real good feeling with Iowa. Last question. Any New Year's resolution? Make our country great again. All right, Mr. Trump, thanks so much. Thank you very much. We'll be right back with our political panel. Stay with us.